I had a two-year relationship with uh, a man whose real name was John Dines. I knew him as John Barker. Some of you may have heard this before. Luckily for you, I'm going to give a shortened version because you've heard from Alison um, and from all the others, so uh, I, I need to condense it. It's a bit long. Um, I, was, I, I was involved with uh, a group called London Greenpeace in the uh, 1980s, late 1980s, and um, after about three years of going to that group and being friends with this guy who I knew as John Barker. We started a relationship um, and then uh, we moved into a flat together and we talked about spending the rest of our lives together and having a family. Um, I loved him deeply, he said that he loved me um, and then after about 18 months of the relationship he seemed to be going through some sort of mental breakdown um, and then he disappeared. Um, and the last I heard from him was a couple of letters which were postmarked from South Africa saying that he'd gone to try and sort his head out and that if he managed to sort it out he'd, he'd kind of come back um, and you know we could get back together. Um, obviously when he disappeared I was extremely worried about his well-being because he would seemed to be going through some sort of a breakdown and I was also extremely upset about having lost, lost this person that um, had, I'd loved so much and um, had wanted to spend my future with. And um, so I then embarked on a, a massive search to try and track him down using the clues that I had, um, well, what things that I thought were real about him, uh, like for example, while we'd been in a relationship, he told me about his mother and his father dying and I went to try and find out, um, I went to try and find their, their death certificates in the hope that that might give me a clue as to where he was where he was from and maybe the solicitors and I could find him that way um, you know in terms of the will um, but everything that I investigated actually just uh, turned up it was basically like me meeting a wall you know everything turned out to be false uh, and so I became increasingly concerned um, about who he'd really been um, and then one day uh, while I was fighting the McLeibel trial in the 1990s, on the way home from court, um, I was passing uh, the registry of births, deaths and marriages and just really on, on a kind of instinctive feeling I decided to go in um, and look through the death records. And when I did that I found out that my, the name that my partner had been using was actually the name of a child who died when they were eight years old. Um, and really when I saw that my world kind of really fell apart because here was, I, you know, I'd spent so much time with this person, uh, I thought I knew him really well and actually he didn't exist. I didn't even know his name. Um, and if you, if you try and think about what that does to you, basically I then started looking at everybody else around me thinking, well how do I know that any of you are real? Um, and it really messes with your head, as Alison has described, you know, you, you kind of descend into what, what some people call paranoia, um, but then people also said that we were being paranoid thinking that we had uh, undercover police officers in our life. So it's like, where does the paranoia um, start and end and, and where does reality start and end? Um, it, it basically left me not really knowing who to trust and being very unsure of my own judgement because if I could be so wrong about somebody who I knew so well, how could I be sure I'd be right about anything else? Um, I continued in my search and eventually I found um, the marriage certificate. I, I found out the real name of, of um, my former partner, John Dines. Um, and I found his marriage certificate which said that he'd been a police officer at the time he got married in the, in the late 1970s. Um, and, I, and at that point I kind of thought, right, that's it, I, I now know the truth that he was a, he was a police officer. But I, I, there, were, there hadn't been many people I had talked to about this because, um, you know, obviously if, if, if the potential was that he'd been an undercover policeman, I obviously didn't want to um, talk to anybody else just in case they were also undercover police and if they knew that I was searching for him and trying to find out the truth, they'd put barriers in my way and try and stop me finding, finding out. So there were a very limited number of people that I talked to about this. Um, but when I talked to people about, well, look, you know, I found this marriage certificate, 
can you believe it? He's, he's, he, he must have been an undercover policeman. People actually said to me, including my dad, no, you're being paranoid, that wouldn't happen in this country. There must be another explanation. You know, it, it must be that, oh, actually, he, he'd been a policeman and he'd decided much later on that he wanted to become a political activist, but he was embarrassed about his police background and so he'd, you know, made up this identity. People really didn't want to believe that that could happen in this country, that you could have under police, undercover policemen having relationships with women for years on end. Uh, and that in itself uh, did more, you know, mess with my head even more because it's sort of like, oh well, these people who I, who I kind of trust around me are sort of saying, you know, listen to yourself, uh, you seem to be becoming a bit paranoid. Um, all the while that my search was going on, actually the police were taking steps to prevent me finding out the truth. What I now know is that uh, when I got close to finding him, when I went to New Zealand, um, they, they actually moved him to another country. They relocated him to prevent me finding him. Uh, and the only reason that I found out the truth is because one of the other women in our case that um, Harriet and Alison have talked about, one of the other women um, had ended up uh, finding uh, the, the, um, the guy that she'd had a relationship with and ended up uh, having children with him and married to him and during the course of that marriage uh, he, he actually told her that my ex-partner had been an undercover policeman. So the only reason that the, the truth came out was not through the police, it was, um, it was through the detective work of, 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 of women in these, uh, in these abusive relationships. Um, about the same time that she contacted me uh, to, to, to tell me this, was around the same time that the Mark Kennedy case was being exposed in the media and as you've heard he was being portrayed as a rogue officer, gone off the rails, um, done his own thing, it's not the fault of the police um, and obviously we knew different and we got together to bring this case. Um, there were, as you've heard, eight of us in this case. We had relationships between us with uh, five different undercover officers and those relationships spanned a period of nearly 25 years. So that absolutely shows that this was not the actions of individual officers, this is an institutional practice, it's institutional sexism. Um, and, you know, recent years have seen the uh, massive scandal of celebrity phone hacking, uh, which is widely recognised to be a, a complete invasion of privacy, and as one of my co-claimants has said in, in our case, the relationships that we were in were like body hacking. They basically, these men used our, and the police, used our bodies and our minds. Um, they had access to our innermost thoughts because we thought that they were real people and that we were engaged in loving relationships. So, you know, we shared our innermost thoughts with them. We've got absolutely no idea how much of that is now on special branch files. Um, the psychological damage, um, uh, you know, arising from this emotional manipulation uh, and having been used gratuitously in this way is, is huge. Um, and, you know, those of us that were in relationships um, and the, when our partners disappeared, uh, you know, the fear and worry about someone you love disappearing also causes a huge emotional toll. Um, and, you know, when someone disappears like that, the, the only person that really can make sense of, of um, that disappearance because you seem like you're in a, a loving relationship and then this person's disappearing um, and, and none of it makes any sense. The only person that can make sense of that for you is actually the person who's been abusing you and it leaves women totally vulnerable to then those men coming back into their life and um, you know abusing them further, which is actually what happened with the woman who got ended up having children and getting married. He, you know, was basically able to 
completely manipulate her emotions uh, and, and continue the abuse. She actually had to escape to a women's refuge to get away from him. Um, so it's absolutely shocking that these kind of uh, actions could be even considered uh, as appropriate by the police, the state, who are supposed to, you know, who proclaim that they're here to protect our interests. It's absolutely shocking that they could think it was appropriate to treat women in this way. Um, I think, you know, you really have to ask how it was that they came to think it was okay to use women to, um, to shore up these fake identities of these undercover police officers. And, and basically, you know, for a very long time there had been a, a canteen culture uh, of predominantly male police officers um, in the Metropolitan Police. In this particular unit, there were no women at all until the Greenham Common protest started in, in the early 1980s. And at that point, um, sorry, I should just say that the unit started in 1968, uh, around about the time of the Vietnam War protest. So for the first sort of 10, 15 years, there were no women in this unit. Um, not that that would make it all right, but it just demonstrates, um, you know, their, their attitude towards women. Uh, that, that they, the, the way that people are, are, are treated. Sorry, I'm losing my thread a little bit. Um, I also wanted to talk about the, the institutional sexism that we've seen within the legal system. Uh, it's not just the police. Um, early on in this process, we were trying to uh, expose what had happened, and we went to the Home Affairs Select Committee. Um, and when we went to them, they asked us what we what we'd done to, to, uh, to end up in these relationships, you know, what must you have been involved in to have these police officers uh, enticing you into relationships. We were basically being expected to prove our innocence. Um, you know, it's a bit like the, the attitude that says that if you're a woman walking along at night in a short skirt, you deserve to get raped. It's, it's and in this instance, it's institutional sexism. Um, you know, at, the, at this Home Office Affairs, sorry, Home Affairs Select Committee, um, the police that gave, the, the senior police officer that gave evidence after us was repeatedly asked if she was going to apologise to the families of the children uh, who had died, whose identities had been used by undercover police officers. Not once was she asked if she was going to ap apologise to the women who had been deceived into intimate long-term relationships. Um, there was basically uh, an assumption that as women, we must be guilty, we must have brought this upon ourselves. Um, and yet, you know, these are, many of these MPs that were on that select committee are former lawyers. They should know that there is no law in this country that says that if the police suspect someone of a crime, let alone if they suspect them of political activism, that they are then entitled to sleep with them in order to, uh, to find out if they were up to something. Um, you know, and it's not surprising that that's not the law because it would be absolutely, it's obvious it would be absolutely wide open to abuse for any male officer to say, oh yeah, well I suspected them so I had to sleep with them. Um, we face the institutional sexism of the decision from the Crown Prosecution Service which um, Harriet's talked about um, where basically, so I'll just say briefly, they declined to prosecute the officers for sexual assault uh, or misconduct in public office because they said the relationships were based on uh, genuine feelings of mutual attraction, which is absolutely, uh, completely inappropriate and insulting response. The consent was obviously negated by the huge level of deception. There is no way on this earth that anybody would consent to have a relationship with somebody if they knew that everything about that person was false uh, and that that person was in their life to spy on them. Um, and basically what we've seen is a legal system that doesn't value women's lives, um, that... Uh, as, as Harriet said, you can't claim for the loss of time, you can only claim for the loss of wages. Um, so that's another thing where obviously women are of, often responsible uh, for looking after children, that counts for nothing, or they want to have 
They want they feel the relationships are important. That uh, they want to spend time um, ensuring those relationships are successful. That all counts for nothing. The only thing that matters is what your wage is, what you're bringing in. Um, they counted our lives basically as having no financial value. Um, and as the others have mentioned, there's only a finite time for women to have children if they want to have them. So the loss of the ability to, of the opportunity to have children uh, counts for nothing in, in, in the eyes of the legal system. Um, anyway, <laughs> enough of the sexism of the legal system, even though you could really go on for <laughs> quite a lot longer about that. Um, as the others have said, um, we had the recent victory in, in November where, despite everything, the police were forced to acknowledge that these relationships were abusive um, and um, that they were uh, a breach of our human rights and that they uh, caused significant trauma. But as the others have said, um, we still have no answers to why this abusive behaviour was allowed to happen. We've had absolutely no disclosure. Um, so that's where the public inquiry comes in. We want to make sure that the cover names are released because without the release of the cover names, any other women or anyone else who was affected by this undercover policing is not able to come forward to give evidence about what happened to them what the other undercover officers did, did. and so there's no way for people to, um, or there's no way for the, the wider public or the inquiry to, to see just the extent of this abuse. Uh, it's no good just looking at a tiny bit and saying, oh well, you know, we know about that. Uh, the reality is, you know, there were, um, this was going on for over 40 years with the SDS alone, and then it's happened, it's continued with the National Public Order Intelligence Unit and the National Domestic Extremism Unit. Um, and, you know, for all we know, it's ongoing. It's highly likely to be ongoing, although, you know, increasingly they are shifting to, to, to spying on us through social media. So, um, the reality is we have to have the cover names released so that the true extent of these abuses can be seen. Um, because ultimately what we want to do is to make sure that these abuses never happen to anybody else again. Um, the, the police have actually said that it's no longer, these relationships are no longer allowed, but um, they, they don't actually put any instructions in writing explicitly saying no un undercover, relationship, uh, undercover police officers are not allowed rela un relationships, and the legal framework is still the same as it was when Mark Kennedy uh, was um, abusing the women that he had relationships with. Um, in terms of the public inquiry, which is getting underway, we're having the preliminary hearings, um, the other key issues uh, to emerge and which also require the, um, you know, the full disclosure, the truth to come out, um, are the, the spying on the grie grieving families of, of um, victims of racist murders uh, or police malpractice uh, simply for challenging what the police were doing uh, and their inadequate um, investigations or their, or their violence uh, families have been spied on. The uh, links with the, the blacklisting of trade unionists where information from from the police has been found in the offices of a private company, the Consulting Association, uh, in their files uh, about trade unionists and health and safety reps that were um, made available to um, construction companies uh, in order for them to decide that they don't want to hire these people, they were prevented from getting work. There was information that could only have come from the police, information about um, demonstrations and um, and actually, in my case, I'm on the environmental blacklist, uh, and I know that um, through the, the McLeibel case in the 1980s, it was shown through that case that there had been an exchange of information between the police and McDonald's and a private investigation firm, two, two private investigation firms, in fact, that they were using to, to send private investigators into London Greenpeace. So there's a, um, a complete sharing of, well, it's an extensive sharing of information between the police and private corporations, uh, which when we sued the police, um, 
In 2000, they actually said that they would remind all police officers that they weren't to share it, private information on the police national computer with private companies, uh, and they've still been doing it through the blacklisting, um, through, through the black, blacklisting files through the consulting association. Um, on top of that, in the inquiry, a very important issue is all the miscarriages of justice. Um, so far, there are around 150 wrongful convictions that have been exposed just in relation to Mark Kennedy, um, and he's just one officer. And we now have, you know, nearly 50 years of these units. Um, how many more miscarriages of justice are there that are currently hidden from public view and people suffering the consequences of um, unjust convictions that, have, you know, may affect your life in quite a serious way? Uh, where undercover police officers have either given evidence using their false names in court uh, or have taken part in legal, privileged legal, legal discussions um, and then, you know, the potential for them feeding that straight back to uh, the, the, the legal team you know, on the opposite side. Um, the, all of this needs to come out in the public inquiry. Um, you know, basically the inquiry is a very rare opportunity to seek to ensure that all of these dirty practices which I use to undermine uh, movements for social progress are brought out into the open, that the public becomes aware of them and that they're stopped. Um, if you'd said five years ago about all of these events, no one would have believed it. Um, since 2011, a huge amount of public in, uh, of information has come out into the public domain. Um, but we need to ensure that the full picture comes out. Um, you know, the, the... In our case, the police claimed that they could neither confirm nor deny anything in relation to the officers. Um, they basically said that this was permanent and across the board, and yet, if you look into it, they've, they've made several statements where they have confirmed or denied uh, things about undercover operations, including a three-part television series that was basically a puff piece in, in um, around about... 2002. 2002. <laughs> I was trying to calculate how many years it was, but... Um, <laughs> you know, which talks gave extensive detail about the movements that they were infiltrating, there were interviews with officers, um, they talked about the tactics they used. So, you know, the fact that they're now claiming they can't talk about any of those things, it's absolutely clear it's because they want to cover up these abuses. They don't want the full truth to come out. Um, so, we all have to make sure that the public inquiry does get to the truth, that the, public, that the wider public becomes aware of these abuses, um, these units are a significant part of the process that prevents change from happening and that ensures that um, the people that have got huge wealth and who currently hold power are, um, are propped up, you know, despite this being against the interests of the rest of us in society, the vast majority of the population. Uh, sorry, I've got a <laughs> Um, I, just, I just wanted to mention one other important thing um, that I really only sort of um, came to mind when about two months ago I was, well never mind what, I basically discovered that my former partner was about to be involved in delivering training to uh, Indian police officers in Australia and that that training included uh, training in left-wing extremism um, and I became extremely concerned that these now discredited practices um, uh, that the Metropolitan Police have acknowledged are human rights abuses should not be perpetuated uh, by other police forces around the world. Um, so I went over to Australia to expose his past um, and confronted him. But I think that's actually a really important issue because many of these undercover officers have gone on to have careers either in um, uh, other police forces or, or educational institutions. 
uh, or private sector where actually they may be in a position where they're encouraging similar kind of abuses to happen to other people. So I think that's a, a, an issue that needs to be kind of taken up um, and uh, made sure it doesn't, doesn't happen elsewhere. Um, and then finally, because I'm being asked to hurry up, <laughs> I just wanted to say that the most important thing for us to, um, to, to fight about is to continue to not be deterred by these undercover officers. You know, the reality is that they're in our movements trying to undermine them because they know that when we do talk to other people about the kind of change that we want to see in the world and the fact that um, we don't have to put up with injustice and oppression, we could create a society that is based around meeting everybody's needs and respect for each other uh, and respect for the environment. Um, don't be deterred, keep on at it. It is, uh, you know, we need to create a better society um, with a sustainable future and uh, yeah, keep on at it, sorry. <laughs>